you go. All right, so um, this is the third lecture and I realize I updated the date correctly, that's good. Okay, so um, let me briefly tell you, provide you a quick overview of what today's lecture, lecture is going to be. First recap so that we know where we are and that you know in which lecture, which lecture you're attending. So basically what we've done so far is we worked out together the type system and the operational semantics for an intuitionistic linear session typed uh, language uh, called SIL. And uh, uh, basically when you look up in papers, there are various papers on it. And importantly, that um, this language kind of relies on the Curry-Howard correspondence established between intuitionistic linear logic and the session type pi calculus. And uh, what we've also seen is that basically progress and preservation uh, fall out almost for free in that setting. I mean, once you add in recursive type, it's, it's less obvious but otherwise uh, it follows from cut elimination. All right, so what are we going to do today? So I want to, I, I'm still debating because uh, I really want to focus on the latter part, which is where I say switch gears and uh, talk about shared session types. But I think it's helpful to also briefly talk about persistence truth, which is also referred to as bang or of course. And maybe I will skip a few slides there just in the interest of time so that we have enough time to talk about the, the remainder. All right, so before uh, starting with that, I want to follow up on a question that was posted on Slack, which was really a great, great question. And I think it makes it might benefit everyone if we briefly look at that question together. So, um, so the question was basically, so the person went back, unfortunately, I forgot the name, I apologize for that. Um, the person went back uh, to the, through the slides and looked at the rule at the typing rule for cut, and then also the dynamics for cut. And just to remind you, basically, so here in the type rule, we say, so we have currently a process that is spawning the process P and then continues as Q. So in the continuation, Q has now access, uh, is connected via a channel to this newly spawned process. And then in parallel, we have the process P running that offers along X. And we also saw because of linearity, because we don't have contraction, we have to split the resources. And then, so let's look now at the dynamics. So, we have basically in the pre-state one process running, that's the process that offers along channel C is running this code here. And then in the post-state, we have two processes. So we still have the process C, which is the client that, or the spawner. And we have now a new process that is running in parallel that offers along channel A. Okay. And then the, the question was basically, what about the X's and what about the A's and the C's? All right, this is really important, but I, I have to go basically like, we have to do kind of iterative deepening. So one important thing is when, when we look at typing rules, here the X's and the C's and also the Y's that I'm using, even though I sloppily refer to them as channels, what they really are are variables. So th those are channel variables. But once we execute the program and in the dynamics, we're kind of simulating uh, the program execution. Once we run the program, we have runtime structures. So that these are those processes. And I made the analogy with, with reference cells in a, in a heap okay, or locations in a heap. So a process is really an entity that exists at runtime. And as such, also the channels along which a process offers, these are the runtime entities. And I'm using different meta variables here. So I use ABC to refer to channels and XYC are channel variables, all right? So what you can see is that we are actually allocating here a new channel A. And, but 
when when we write the code, right? When we write down the code, or our program code, in that code we have variables. So that's why when we execute now p in the body of p in the code, we still have occurrences for variables, and that's why we have to basically substitute the actual channel now in the body of x, so that the remain remaining code is executed correctly. Okay, another thing that was asked, this person tried to draw a picture because I used earlier when we talked about the configuration typing, I drew those pictures for you. And I found that an excellent idea. And that's actually what I do too, especially once you start to reason about properties that have to be maintained at runtime, it's really helpful to think about those pictures. Um, all right, so if we were to capture the pre-state, then we have one process that is offering along channel C. And then here I have the process itself that's running code C, I, S, sorry. So um, I'm just basically S stands for, because I have to abbreviate it because of space. So S stands for running this code over here. Well, what happens in the post state? Well, in the post state, we have two processes. But as you can see, the the, the, the T which stands for this code over here that is spawned actually because when we look here in the typing rule, it's going to be a child of the spawner. So now we have basically the spawner and the spawnee and the spawnee is a child of the spawner. Okay, so I encourage you to, draw, to go through the rules again and also draw those pictures for other connectives. That's kind of a homework I would like to assign. And in particular, look at Tensor and Lolly and try to draw the pictures for, for those connectives. Okay, so let me briefly, because now I'll continue, but I, I was thinking I should maybe ask whether there are any questions on that. Oh, one question. Uh, okay, so the only way to create a new channel is to spawn a new process and the new channel ties the new process question mark and, and the new channel has what and the new channel ties to the new process correct yes spawning is the way to allocate it's like spawn is like alloc all right good okay so i i hope this is helpful uh all right so now let's explore uh uh persistence okay so it's also referred to as, of course, uh, basically those people among you who are familiar with linear logic might have noticed that there's one connective that is still missing, which is the persistence truth, persistent truth. So far we have covered these connectives, but there's this bang A or of, of course that we have not yet accommodated. And the operational semantics is the one of replication. So um, let me briefly uh, provide an introduction to that. I'm not going to dive very deeply because I um, want to spend enough time on, on shared sessions, which really give us the expressiveness that we need in, 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 in practical programming scenarios. Okay, so, but what is the meaning of a process of type bang A? It means that it, it means that this process can be used arbitrarily often. So it means in particular that it can have an unbounded number of clients. Okay, so let's think about it first, like what does it mean computationally when we, when we have a process of this type and how does it evolve? Okay, so here I'm now going to um, represent two processes, a client queue, which is a linear process, and then a persistent process P here. And you can see I using, it has like this kind of, it, it looks like a cogwheel, all right? So I'm representing it differently. So that's a persistent uh, process and it offers a session of type bang A, okay? So if a client now, the only thing that a client can do really with that process is to ask it for a copy of itself. Okay, so we can obtain a copy and then we get the following picture. So here note that 
the client now got access, got a new, a new process got created, which is linear, that offers now a session of type A along a ch linear channel X. And in addition, the client still has access, uh, keeps its access basically to the process P. But that's really all you can do with it. So the, the bang A corresponds to replication in the pi calculus. And also in the pi calculus, we use the exclamation mark for it. OK, so let's briefly have a look at the typing rules and the dynamics that govern uh, this new connective. I wanted to briefly point out something here. Um, I, I added here this little star, and there is a footmark here. So when we look at the rules, then you will see that actually I should have omitted here the exclamation mark. So I'm just pointing this out, but from intuitively it makes it more sense to put it, okay? Uh, but just for those of you who are familiar with the rules already, I'm, I, I, I know that I, strictly speaking, did something wrong here, but it was in order to help the intuition. Okay, so now that we have those new connectives, we are going to extend our typing judgment because we now have a new proposition, a new, new connective. And the typing judgment that we are using is this one, where, as you can see, I have an additional context here. And this is the context in which I am storing, if you want, persistent channels. So delta is still a linear context, but now psi basically keeps track of all the persistent channels that we have. So let me point out, because I said that Previously, when we, we saw it in the picture, when the client got a copy from the persistent process, it still afterwards had access to the persistent process. So that means that actually for persistent channels, we do support contraction and weakening. So here, the judgment, basically we, we're, we have two contexts, the linear context delta, where we only store uh, linear channels for which we do not have contraction and weakening. But then inside, we store the persistence channels that for, for which contraction and weakening is allowed. All right. So some people might uh, be familiar with different formulations of linear logic with BAN. So I'm pointing out here that we're using a dyadic formulation, which was introduced by Andre Oli. So in particular, what that means is that we have this extra context psi, okay? So psi really just contains persistent channels. So which means those types, so basically psi is, is a set of channels U, U1, B1 to U and BN. And the types that are in this context, we don't have to put the ex exclamation mark explicitly because by the, by the judgment, we know having an extra context that those types implicitly are bank typed, okay? However, we also have the possibility to keep a persistent channel treated linearly and keep it in, in delta. And then we have to add the, the ban, all right? And I'm pointing this out because some people might have only seen the formulations where we don't have a dyadic judgment, meaning that we only have delta and then we always have to use the ban. All right, so the rules that I'm now providing are specifically for this dyadic formulation. And they are again, some judgmental rules and one of the rules is copy, which we've basically seen before in the picture. So that's the typing rule for copy. Um, so what it allows us to do is, as we've seen in the picture, to basically obtain a linear copy of a persistent process. So as you can see, here we are basically a client and what we are doing is in our now structural context, we have a persistent channel 
of type U colon A. And what we are doing is we say, hey, give me a linear copy. So we're sending to you a new channel X. And then in our continuation, we have in our linear context now, our linear copy of the persistent server that offers a long channel X. So I would like to point out that because we have contraction for the structural context phi, we are not losing access to you, but the continuation still has access to it. So we could go ahead and get another copy. And now we have two copies. Okay, so let's briefly look at the dynamics. So what happens when we execute the, co uh, the copy? Um, so here we have the persistent server that basically corresponds to this guy up here. And I'm using here now a predicate with an exclamation mark. This predicate is a persistent predicate. It means it's always there. It, so what it really means is even in the post date, it's available. We're just not writing it because persistent uh, predicates uh, are never consumed. Okay. so. Here we have the persistent server that is um, expecting to receive a new channel along which it has to spawn uh, the, the, the linear copy. And the client is sending along this persistent channel, a new channel. And then in the continuation, we now have create and spawn a new process that is for the linear copy that runs along channel A, or is substituting that channel for the X in, uh, in P sub X. And also on the client side, we're you running Q, but now use A for X. Okay. So there's another judgmental rule which allows us to spawn just a persistent server, right? The copy rule assumed the existence of a persistent server, but we also have to be able to spawn them. Okay, so here's the typing rule. So uh, again here, uh, we're basically spawning a persistent server along U. And now in our continuation, in our structural context, we have access to U. And uh, then we have the persistent server running. One thing I want to point out here, we are insisting that delta has to be empty and that allows us to consider that as a persistent uh, server. Okay, in the dynamics, again, we're basically here spawning this new persistent uh, server. And now we're creating a fresh channel and that's the channel along which this pers persistent uh, server is running. All right, and then just briefly the rules the, the left and right rules for the ban. So, so far we've looked at the judgmental rules and now we're going to look at the right rule and the left rule. So those rules again, allow us to basically spawn a persistent server. So here we have a client. It is going to receive um, along the channel X. So here we have in our linear context, a bang A, so access to a persistent server, server. And now we're going to, in the continuation, we receive basically a new persistent uh, channel that we put in our context side. And then here at the bottom, we have the dynamics. Uh, so we have here the client that receives along A, a um, and access to the new channel to be used for the persistent server. Here we have the linear bang resource that sends, uh, sends a new channel. And then in the, in the continuation, we have the new persistent server. Okay, so I, in an interest of time, I, I would like to continue. I'm happy to take questions later on. But um, really what I want you to take away from this 
is um, what the basic semantics uh, is provided by, of course. All right. So let's uh, take stock. So what, of course, or persistence really achieves for us is what I said earlier is replication. But really important is that it basically shields the clients from each other's effects. So let me illustrate that briefly. So if we have two clients that are connected to a persistent server P, so we have Q1 and Q2, now each of them can interact with the persistent server, but all you ever can really get from a persistent server is to obtain a copy, a linear copy of the server, all right? So Q1 could get, go ahead and, and uh, get a copy, which is now P prime, and Q2 also could go ahead and get a copy, which is now P2. So what is important here in this scenario that any communication of one client with its copy, so if Q1 interacts with P prime, won't affect um, the state of P double prime, right? So really those things are independent, they're orthogonal. And I'm pointing this out because it tells you when, depending on your application, when to use um, a persistent server or not, right? So for some applications, this is exactly the semantics you want, but for other applications, you actually want side effects to happen. Uh, we know all that side effects are in principle bad, right? But if we can control them, sometimes that's exactly what we want, or that's what the kind of the application domain requires from us. Um, so maybe I can give you a quick example. Um, I'm always doomed to confuse the two terms, but anyway, there's Android, right? And on the Android platform, they have this notion of multi-instance app and single instance app, all right? And I'm always confusing the two, but and one of them is actually exactly the semantics that we get from BAN. So it's a replication semantics, whereas the other would really be a true sharing semantics. So I'm just mentioning that, that there are really real-world scenarios where both semantics might be the right thing. I would argue, but I'm also biased because of my research, that really for many real world scenarios, you actually need the sharing semantics. And I, I can, you know, uh, follow up on, on Soares session. So um, in his session, uh, in, in his session type library, Ferrite, he supports shared sessions. And without that, he couldn't have, so he re-implemented the communication paths of the, uh, of the Canvas component in Servo. And for this, uh, being able to have shared sessions was actually really important. All right. So what I would like to do next is to explore how we can expand, um, expand intuitionistic linear logic session types with shared sessions that provide us a sharing semantics. And there's been a series of papers published by me and my co-authors that use that term manifest sharing to, um, to basically account for a very specific scenario of sharing. Uh, and that's what I would like to talk to you about today. All right, uh, any questions? Uh, there's one question, but feel free to uh, not answer if it's mm -hmm. going to take long. So the question is, um, by allowing contraction in the bangs, uh, does this introduce the possibility of having a cycle in the tree? Uh -huh. Very and good question. And mm -hmm. overall, like, what are the impacts of the cycle? Right, right, right. No, it doesn't. It's, it's contraction, but you can ever, what can you do with a, with a, with a uh, persistent channel? You can only ever get a copy. And once you get the copy, you, it's a linear reference to the copy. 
So it, it is really there's no shared state. Well, you can get the cycle between different providers, shared providers, right? Or persistent providers. Um, I think you cannot. I, um, okay. I once traced it out because you also have like for those languages, if you don't have recursive type and you have that, you, you still get uh, all the good properties. So you cannot get, get cycles. The importance is really that any communication paths where you do have message exchange is, is still confined to a tree structure. Okay, so, um, and yes, no, actually you cannot because I traced it out. What is important, basically you get like, it's like in a pure functional programming, you get kind of this kind of forward moving. So you could introduce cycles if, for example, you could pass unrestricted channels along linear channels. But without that, there's no way for you to close ever the loop, even if you have contraction. It's, uh, it's, it's quite subtle. But if, if uh, so the, 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 even the, you have contraction, but even the, share, the, the unrestricted channels uh, can only be passed kind of forward. When you spawn, you can give pass on uh, the unrestricted channels. But in order to create really a cycle, you need to be able to have uh, higher order uh, unrestricted channels. You have to be able to create the backwards flow, basically. All right, but good question. All right, so now fasten your seatbelts. Now we get get a little bit chaos. Okay, so in the in the system that I'm introducing now we will have the possibility to create those cycles, okay? And, all right, so let's, let's dive in. So, okay, so what are the key ideas of ma manifest sharing? Well, the first um, idea is basically to, okay, um, if we rule out aliases, then it might, it's, it's wonderful, we get good guarantees, but it might, too limiting, might be too limiting. So do permit aliases, but we make sure that we kind of control aliasing. And as a result of this, uh, we can, we are able to guarantee uh, preservation. The key ideas for guaranteeing preservation is that we require that any communication along a channel um, requests prior exclusive access. So if we have different clients that want to interact with a truly shared process, then they have to interact in mutual exclusion from each, from each other. Then there's another requirement where we make sure that whenever we give up uh, exclusive access, we kind of get, the, get back to a good state, all right? And then the next idea or ingredient is to make, to kind of impose this idea or embed th those ideas in the type structure. All right, so these are just the high level ideas and probably they went right over your, off, over your head. That's okay, we're now exploring them together, okay? But that's kind of, I just want to kind of foreshad foreshadow them. Uh, so, the work that I'm presenting today is based on, uh, on the paper that I'm listing down here. So that's by myself and Frank Fenning. It's called Manifest Sharing with Session Types and it appeared in ICFP 2017. Okay, so let's start again um, by basically distilling the distinction between a copying and a sharing semantics. So the copying semantics is what we get with linear band. And so I'm, I have here basically a, a persistent server P with two clients. And then here on the, on, on the other side, I have a, a, a true server, a shared server. And, and note that I'm, I'm um, displaying it slightly differently. So this looks like a cogwheel, but this one not, and it's just red, okay? Red signals danger, all right? So we note that as I pointed out, so this one is a persistent um, uh, channel. 
And then over here, we have a shared channel. And the, the way how we can um, observe that is that I use the subscript S here for the type, okay? So we know that this shared process offers a session of type A sub S, where A sub S is a shared type. Okay, so far so good. I'll, we'll, I'll dive deeper later on. So I just want you to kind of take away the main ideas at this point. Okay, yeah, and I, I was pointing out already earlier, so those symbols look slightly differently, all right? Okay, so now what happens, as we saw before, if uh, we obtain a copy, then we basically get this scenario. So we have now a copy of P, which is P prime, and we have a linear access to it. So that's a private linear copy. Well, with the sharing semantics, we do not want that. There, actually, we want to have the following scenario that when Q1 kind of obtains exclusive access uh, of the shared server P, then what we want is basically that Q1 now has a private linear channel to P along which it's, it, it can interact. All right. But, but really, so I thought it's worthwhile to have those two figures next to each other because you can see the semantics is different. And one is not better than the other. It just, these are two possible semantics that might be suited in your particular application domain. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, so at the, at the bottom line, really we have here two sharing because Q1 here has its own copy. So whatever it, in, whatever it does with it won't be visible to Q2. However, in this setting, Q1 will be able to kind of interact with P and that might affect if Q2 later on interacts with P. Okay, so now, of course, in principle, everything could go wrong, right? And as I said, we want to make sure that there's, there's some sanity. So we want to kind of control how the different clients can interact and at which point and so forth. And I said earlier, basically, and you're all familiar with it, right? Whenever we deal with concurrent programming, at the end of the day, a, a useful tool is to use the tool of mutual exclusion. So let's take this idea and basically adopt an acquire release policy with our shared processes. So that's kind of key idea number one for manifest sharing. So let's explore this again in, in this picture. Now I'm going to slightly change that picture because I have my reasons for it. So here Q1 and Q2 are actually linear resources. So they're linear processes here. And I'm going to always color them henceforth in this light blue, all right? So I do the same for Q2. And P is a share process, so I keep it in red. So here you can see at the bottom in the legend. So I have blue for linear processes, red for share processes. Then I will use, as before, this connect connection for linear channels. And I'm going to use now for shared channels to, to kind of tell them apart for, uh, from linear ones, I use that this dotted arrow. So also here in the figure, I'm going to draw that correspondingly. So now what we can see is that we have a shared channel. And remember, do you remember in the first lecture when I draw the PyCalculus picture? Now we're back to that scenario, right? So in that picture, I said, well, in the PyCalculus in general, we can have anary connections. And by introducing those shared channels, we'll get back to that. So that also tells you now that we're basically now uh, at the expressive, expressive, expressiveness level of the PyCalculus. All right, so now that we have that, that shared channel, that is shared among Q1 and Q2 to, to, the, to the server P. Now, it, basically what it means is, and, and we adopt an acquire release semantics. So that means that both clients have to contend for obtaining exclusive access of P, and only once they have exclusive access of P, they can go ahead and communicate linearly with that process. Okay. So in order to do that, the process 
the process is the clients have to send an acquire message. So here in this example, Q1 went ahead and sent that acquire message. I was maybe a little bit fast and I have this nice animation, so let's do it again. Voila, okay. So Q1 went ahead and sent the acquire message to the share process. Well, what happens now? The share process now becomes linear and it gives back to the client a linear connection to it. So now Q1 has exclusive access to P along its private linear channel Y. And now Q can, Q1 can go ahead, interact with P along this linear channel. And once it's happy and done interacting, it has to relinquish its exclusive access of P. In order to do that, it is going to send a release message along the linear channel that it has. And as a result of this, P becomes shared again and Q1 lost its linear channel to P. So now if Q1 wants to interact with P again, it has to contend for it again. So by the same token, that holds also true for Q2. And what is important to notice here is that this is now a source of non-determinism, right? Because either Q1 or Q2 actually can get kind of obtain exclusive access. That's non-deterministic. What I would like to point out is that we can only send acquire messages along the shared channels. So any other communication that we've seen so far can only happen along linear channels. Okay, so now we've seen that we adopt kind of a programming agent, if you want, of acquire release to make sure that before we interact with a process, we, a shared process, we have to acquire it. That process becomes linear. We get back the linear connection to that process, can communicate with it, then we relinquish the linear uh, channel, uh, the, the access, lose the linear channel and so forth. So what, that, what, what, what does that tell us? It basically tells us that all of a sudden we can view uh, processes as being in one of two phases, either they're linear or they're shared. And given that, we can take it, a, take it a step further, right? We could now leave it at this and basically just ask people to do locking if you want, as it's done today in some programming languages that deal with shared memory and concurrency. But why not take the idea of session types to the next step? Well, session types are all about prescribing how to interact with the process. Well, by the same token, we can prescribe in the type whether we should acquire or release. Okay, so we observe that processes are at one of two modes, either they're linear or they're shared. Well, now we can do something fancy. We can actually reflect this kind of two phases or two modes in the type system by phrasing the type system in an adjoint fashion, okay? So we stratify session types into a linear layer, which is here in blue, and a shared layer, which is here in red. I couldn't use the bright red because otherwise we couldn't see the fonts very well, okay? So we have the linear layer here and the shared layer here. And please note that in a sense, the linear layer is below the shared layer. Uh, why is that the case? Because the linear layer has less structural properties, right? The linear layer rejects weakening and contraction. Whereas here in the shared layer, we want to allow weakening and contraction, okay? So now we have those two layers where a linear process would be of a type of this layer and the share process will be of a type of that layer. And as a next thing, what we're going to do is we're now connecting 
those two layers with modalities going back and forth between them. So let me add those connectives. So what you can see here is we have added, extended our existing connectives with a new connective here, which we call down arrow, meaning that it takes, it allows us to embed a shared session type or a shared proposition into the linear layer by shifting it from shared down to the linear layer. And analogously, we're enriching the shared layer with an additional connective, which allows us to embed linear propositions into the shared layer by shifting them up from the linear layer to the shared layer. So the way how to read this is really that the entire thing here is a shared proposition, which has inside basically in its belly, a linear proposition. And similarly here, the whole thing is a linear proposition because the arrowhead is pointing here to the L mode. Here, the arrowhead is pointing to the S mode. So here, this is a linear proposition that encapsulates a shared proposition. Okay. And what we're also going to need, and that kind of goes back to the question I got earlier, we are going to also add connectives that allow us to send shared channels along linear channels. So I'm using here the connectives exist and pi. Some people might um, know those connectives, they, they're used for dependent types. Just let me know you, uh, tell you that we're not using any dependency here. We haven't explored that. Okay, so all this connective says is this, this is a shared channel output. So we're sending a shared channel of type A sub S and then we continue with the session B sub L, a linear session. And this, this connective is input. So we are expecting to receive a channel of type A sub S, which is a shared type. And then we continue with the linear session that is of type B sub L. All right. Okay. Uh, questions up to here. Okay. Then I'll I'll continue. Uh, so, all right. So up to this point, we have an acquires uh, release semantics, and we have this adjoint formulation of the type system. So. Um, so let's briefly have a look at our queue example. And let's ask ourselves, now that we have this type, this type system, so those, this adjoint formulation of our types, and down here we have our queue, and let's assume now we want the queue to be shared. So what that means is basically that at the outset, this thing here is a shared queue, right? So I color it in red. But then basically, once we interact with the queue, once we either send an NQ or a DQ label, this interaction has to happen at the linear mode. So I colored it here in blue. But once we release the queue, we'll release it back to a shared type. So basically, you tell me now how to complement, complete that type, right? Because right now, it's not a well-formed type given our abstract syntax of types. Well, obviously we have to use those kind of shifts, you know, the up arrow and the down arrow. And basically you can go by just looking at the colors, right? We are at the outset shared, and now we want to continue as blue. Well, what does that mean? We actually need an upshift, right? Because the upshift allows us to embed a, a linear type. So it means the continuation is now linear. And then basically we have to fill in the, these parts here. Well, again, we are blue and now we want to go to red. So obviously we have to use a downshift. Okay, so what I really want you to take away at the end of the day, we have found a fancy way of encoding the acquire release discipline in the type system. And we have used an adjoint formulation of the type system. So really, the bottom line is that an upshift translates into an acquire and the downshift 
translates into a release. Okay, so now we have an acquire release and a type system that tells us when to acquire and when to release. So when to acquire and release is no, no longer up for grabs, the type system tells us when it should happen. Well, actually, we need another component to all make it work, which is this um, idea of equi-synchronizing. Well, let me explain to you what it is about. But let me ask you first, well, so far what we've done is we have made sure that by typing in a well-typed program, the clients of a shared process have to interact with the process in mutual exclusion from each other. Well, what do you think? Is that enough to preserve preservation? Well, okay, let's look at this type now, the shared queue type that we, we just developed together, right? Well, when the queue is acquired, it's acquired at type QS, so the shared, the, the QA sub S, the shared type. But what we can see also is now that when we release it, we release it back also to the shared type. So what this means is basically here in the way we have defined the type, we ensure that whenever the process is released, it is released back to the same type at which it was previously acquired. Okay, so that, that seems good, right? But let's look at this type here. So here we acquire the, the, the Q at type QA sub S, so a shared type. When we release it up here, we also release it back to the same type, also down here. But there's another release point where we actually release it now to this type. And now you can think, well, here we're releasing the process back to a different type if we were to take that branch. So what that means is existing clients will assume that the queue, whenever they can interact with it, whenever they have acquired it, it will be a type Q A sub S. But if a client before us actually took this branch here and released it back to that type, then we'll have a protocol violation. Okay. So this tells us that we need something more, right? We have to basically make sure that any type that we define has to be, has to guarantee that we always release back to the type at which uh, the process was previously acquired. So we are imposing a well-formedness conditions on our session types that we can define, which we call equisynchronizing because we basically always have to be going back to the same type. Okay, so, and now we have all the ingredients put together that will guarantee for us that our system guarantees preservation. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me briefly step away. Uh, the AC turned on and I have to lower it. I'll be, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm sorry for that. So are there any questions? Yeah, there's one. Uh, why do we only allow sending shared channels over linear channels, but not the others? Like presumably, presumably I think the question shared. is, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, um, it, it really, um, once I haven't explored it. Uh, so, so basically the idea was to really restrict any kind of effectful computation to the linear fragment. And I think that's a sensible idea. Um, to be honest, um, having uh, the ability to exchange shared channels is really, really important. So 
with that basically you can build circular structures like for example dining philosopher and so forth which you sometimes really want to do and um but because um you can you can always define a shared channel such that it can be acquired so in a sense you're not really losing anything by restricting it to the to the the, the sending a shared channel only allowing it only to be sent over a linear channel but it's a good question i haven't explored it but also you want to um kind of when you when you start out with a project like this it's quite scary because you're changing things fundamentally and you introduce a lot of chaos and it's good to as much as possible you want to have the most expressiveness possible right and we've tried to do that uh, in many regards but it's also good to kind of still being able to reason about it so yeah my answer is i haven't explored it but that being said uh, actually we have for this work um we have an expressiveness result so we we show that we can encode the untyped asynchronous pi calculus into this language so that means basically we get the same expressiveness so we don't seem to be losing anything all right Thanks for that question. Uh, so let's now um, explore together how we can, what, what are the typing rules? What, and, and first, now you're all experts, right? We have to ask ourselves, what is the typing judgment that we use in this system? Okay, so as a reminder on the top, I show you all the connectives that we have now in the resulting system. And now let me just, show you the judgment so basically we are adding two typing judgments so the first one here is the judgment that allows us to type a shared process okay so we have a process p here that offers along a channel or channel variable here x sub s a session of type a sub s and when you look here at the grammar really all that does it's it's something that can be acquired Right, so that's the only type that we have at this level. And then let me point out that um, I have here a structural context gamma. So previously, when we talked about the persistent uh, processes, I used a different meta variable for the structural context. That's deliberate because even though this is a structural context, as also the psi previously, the dynamics of the operational semantics is different, right? Because we have a sharing semantics rather than a copying semantics. Okay, so as you can see that basically a shared process can have access to shared, shared channels. All right, let me also briefly note here, I have here a sigma on a return style. The reason for this is because I, I honestly took, took uh, the judgments uh, that I already had. So in the research paper that you can read, we're, we're um, supporting process definitions. So we can define basically a signature of process definitions and the sigma here refers to that signature. So when we type check a program, we type checked relative to, to, to an existing signature. All right. Um, so let me see what, what animations I have. Right, so, um, well, basically the, the judgments now read, uh, you're already used to that, right? So the first one says the shared process P provides a session of type A sub S along channel X sub S using shared channels in gamma. And then for P means the linear process P provides a session of type A sub L along channel X sub L using channels in gamma and delta. So what is now important is that here, the linear process has not only access to shared channels, but also to linear channels. And then I think I have some further animations. Yeah, so I just want to point out that uh, the, the modes of the sessions offered are different. And also they have access to different contexts. Oops, I'm sorry, I was too fast. And Delta is the linear context that you're already used to. Um, as a side note, some of you might wonder why we do not allow a shared process to have access to linear resources. So why isn't there also like a semicolon delta here? And it's interesting because uh, 
when we worked out this system, we were took inspiration from logic. And in logic, you if if you were to support that, so if in the proof of a proposition that has more structural properties, you are allowed to use propositions with fewer structural properties, then actually cut the elimination fails. So given that result, we we thought we are we are careful. Okay. Then after like um, a few years ago, so after we've done the work, it was published. Uh, we used this type system to actually develop a language for smart contracts. And in there, it was actually quite important for us to, for a share process, to be able to have access to linear resources. And I basically took my proof and change the judgment so that a shared process can also have access to linear resources and type safety failed. And, um, but then later on I was figure, uh, I figured a way in order to allow a, a shared process to have access to linear resources, but under certain restrictions. But I just wanted to point that out. So it's not arbitrary, there are some reasons for it. Okay, so end of side note. All right, so I guess now you might be interested to see uh, how the type rules work for an acquirer and also what, what is the operational semantics. Okay, so let's look at the left rule of the acquirer. So here we are a client that has in its, um, in its shared context gamma, it has an X sub S that offers a shared session, okay? And we are acquiring this channel. And if the acquiry is successful, we are getting back a linear channel to the now linear process. So as you can see now in our continuation queue, we have in our linear context, a shared channel, a linear channel X sub L of type A sub L, okay? What I would like to point out is that in the continuation, because gamma is a structural context, we still have access to that shared channel. So what we could do is we could go ahead and try to acquire it again, right? In the continuation. And obviously that would deadlock. So now I already foreshadowed that we're giving something up by introducing sharing here, but we solved that in the last lecture. Okay, so what is the right rule? So for the right rule, we have here the provider. So that's a, a shared process. It offers a session of type up arrow A sub L. And it's willing to accept a request and an, an acquire request along its offering channel X sub S. And if that's successful, it will continue as a linear process that offers now along an ex, a new linear channel a, a, X sub L that offers a session of A sub L. Note that because it was a shared process, the shared process has basically not, not access to any linear resources. So in the continuation where we now start out as a, a linear process, we just have an empty linear context. Okay, so Let's now have a look at the operational semantics. All right. So here in the, in the pre-state, we have a process that offers along the channel A sub S. Okay, so here I want to show something quickly to you. So what we have is in the dynamics, essentially, we have a channel per process, but every channel comes at one of two modes. It's either L or S, okay? So this allows us here that here in the pre-state we have a shared process. So the process offers along the shared mode of channel A. Once it's successfully acquired, it will continue as process A sub L. So it's now at the linear mode of the channel A. All right, so again, we have a process, it's willing to accept an, an acquire request along its offering channel A sub S. Here we have a client, 
the client tries to acquire a sub s. If it successfully finds that to the variable x sub l, okay, and continues with q. After the transition, we now have successfully acquired the process, so it's now linear. And now we are substituting the linear mode of channel A in the continuation for, of P for X sub L. And we do the same over here by the client. In addition here, we're now uh, creating this predicate unavailable A sub S. It's something really that we only need in the preservation proof. It kind of keeps track. Uh, so basically it maintains an invariant that there's always a, a, a predicate for channel A sub S of a, uh, in, in, in our configuration. Either it's unavailable or it's an actual process. Okay, so now let's look at the release. Well, here is the typing rule, the left rule for, for the release. So again, from the perspective of the client. So as you can see, we have in our linear context access to a linear process that, that is willing to be released. And we're going to release that. Now in the continuation, we have no longer, we've lost access to X sub L but we got back a, a shared reference to the, to the, basically a reference to the process uh, when, when it is shared, okay? All right, what about the right rule? So here we basically use um, kind of the opponent or, uh, of a release is a detach on, on the provider side. So this shows indicates or signals the provider's willingness to, to initiate the release, okay? So here currently the provider is offering a linear session along channel X sub L. It's willing to uh, detach itself and it then continues as a now a shared session along channel X sub S. What is important here is that we insist that a shared process before it uh, sorry, a linear process before it detaches itself, it cannot have any resources left. And that's because of the typing judgment that we insist that a shared process cannot have access to any linear resources, all right? And then here at the bottom, I'm showing you the dynamics. So here now, again, we have the provider that is willing to detach. We have the client that is uh, that wants to release. And then of course, we have here the unavailable a sub s that we created when we when we accepted. So this transitions now to the provider becoming shared. So it's now offering a session along this shared mode of the channel A. And we we lose the predicate unavailable because we now have a process. Okay, so what I was thinking is it would be a good idea again to go through the exercise of implementing uh, the shared the, the shared version of the queue. But before doing that, I'm happy to take any questions. No questions. Okay. So I interpret that as I'm doing an excellent, uh, excellent job, but maybe I'm wrong about that interpretation. So, okay. So, or maybe people are tired. All right, so now let me again do the, the switching to my iPad. I have to give myself a little bit space here. Uh, all right, uh, I have to do that. And then, oops, no, I have to do this. Okay. Okay, so I, Presumably you can now see my iPad. And okay, so what I've done is essentially, so we remember last time we implemented together the linear queue. And so really all that I've done is I copied again here the type, but now we have the shared version of it. So it starts here with an upshift. And then here we have the downshift at the recursion points. Okay. So again, we're going to represent the queue basically as we had here, right? So that was the linear version. 
So we basically represent the queue as a linked list, basically of element processes and an empty process that, that serves as the Sentinel. So that's, we're doing still the same thing. So as a result, we have to basically, again, provide two definitions for processes. One would be the, the, the empty process. And then here on the next page, I have the element process. Okay, so let's go and have a look, try to implement uh, this empty process. Okay, so it, it basically says, all right, so it's offering, uh, let me switch, it's offering a long channel queue, a, a shared session of type Q A sub S, and it doesn't take in any channel arguments. All right, so, well, um, we start out, the first thing is an upshift, which means that the client has to acquire. And since we are now implementing at the provider side, it means that we have to use the left, uh, the right rule for the upshift, which means that we have to accept an acquire request. Okay, so what we're going to do is, we are going to accept Q and we are going to bind this to Q prime. Okay, so we get back a, a new channel variable, okay. So Q here is shared and we're accepting it and now Q prime will be linear. Okay, so what's the next thing after that? So we've, we're, we're done with this, right? Now we have an external choice next. We are even, we are willing to either uh, accept an NQ or a DQ. So again, we're going to now case on the linear channel Q prime. And we have to consider two cases. Either we receive an NQ message or I have to make some space or we receive a DQ message. Okay, so what happens in the NQ message, in the NQ case? Well, we receive now a shared channel reference as the next thing. So we are going to bind that to a variable X and we receive that along Q prime. And basically what we have to do now is we have to create a new Sentinel and then we will recurse again ourselves as, a, as an element process. So that doesn't change but we have to be careful about dealing with the shifts. All right, so the next thing what we are going to do is we are creating a new empty process. Well, note that this empty process now offers a shared queue session. And as a next thing, what we are going to do is we are going to detach the queue. So we are allowing basically the client to release us so we are initiating a release. And then we just recursing as an element process that now takes as an argument, the, the new Sentinel and also the argument, the, the, the channel, the shared channel that we received. Okay, so what happens otherwise in the DQ case? Well, remember that so far we've accepted an acquire request. So we're now running as a linear session. Now we're receiving the DQ message. So the next thing we have to do is we either have to output none or some. Well, since we are empty, we are going to output the label none. And as a next thing we are going to detach And then we just recurse as the empty process. Okay, so now let's look at the element version of the queue. Okay, so it's not vastly different. So I think by now you got the hang of how to deal with the, with the shifts, but still let's um, write that code. So the first thing again is we have to an accept and acquire request.
And then we have to case on the message, the label that we are receiving along Q prime. Again, there are two cases. Either we receive an NQ message, I have to make more space actually, or receive a DQ message. Okay, so again, if it's an NQ, we are going to receive a shared channel, which we bind to Y. But now we basically, what do we want to do, right? We want to pass down basically the, the NQ, the NQ channel down to, to, to our neighbor. So in order to do that, we have to acquire our tail. So that's what we are going to do. We are going to acquire our tail, which we now, the result, if we get the acquire, we have now a linear channel T prime. Along this linear channel T prime, we are going to send the NQ message. And I'm going to save some space here. So, and then we are going to send um, along this linear channel T. So to our tail, basically the element that we've received. And after that, we're happy to release our tail. And then we detach ourselves, allowing a, the client to release ourselves. And then we just recurse as an element process, which is now a shared process, like we had in the linear, similar analogous to the linear uh, implementation. Now let's look at the DQ. Well, again, uh, we've, we've been acquired, we've, we cased, we are now receiving the DQ label. So the next thing we have to do is to indicate whether we empty or not. Well, here it's the element process. So we are going to send along the linear channel, the message sum, and then we're going to DQ the element. So we're going to send the element that we are storing along our linear channel Q prime. Now we are going to detach ourselves. And then we are just going to forward. Okay. So also what this example shows to you is that we have, we also need cut and forward for shared channels, which I haven't showed you, but uh, you, you can find those rules in the paper that I link. Okay, so then let me go back and we're, okay, so we've done that and actually we're almost, we're reaching the end and we're basically also, I'm also wrapping up, so that's nice. Okay, so let's briefly recap. So what we've done now is basically we've extended the intuitionistic linear session type system with an adjoint formulation that allows us to account also for shared sessions. And the result is a guarantees freedom of data races, both low level and high level. And it also guarantees protocol adherence. So for the language that I present, we can prove preservation. And the reason for that is really the fact that um, the interactions happen linear, so kind of effectful computation happens in mutual exclusion from each other. And also that we have the, basically the type that tells us when to acquire, when to release. So it's like this embedding in the type structure plus the wellfulness condition that whenever we release, we have to release back to the type at which we acquired, ensuring that all the aliases, all the clients have a, a, in the same view of, of, the, of the shared process once they start interacting with it. Okay, so I've already alluded to that during the presentation, but let me be very explicit about it. Unfortunately, in this system, we are losing the log freedom. And it's precisely because we can create those cycles because we have contraction and the ability to send shared channels along linear channels. 
And let me also point out to you, actually having that ability is really important to accommodate for certain programming scenarios that you could otherwise not do. And well, the good news is that it doesn't end here. So we don't have just to throw up our hands into the air and say, okay, we'll gain some expressiveness, but we lost out on some guarantees. Well, next time I will talk about how we can take this type system and kind of take ideas from hybrid logic, the, the, the idea of possible worlds, superimpose that on the typing judgment, and then basically get an account of deadlock freedom so that by type checking, we are guaranteed uh, that there are no deadlocks. And then at the end in a resulting system, we have uh, basically both preservation and, and progress, a strong form of progress that we have in a purely linear system. And we can type more programs. <laughs> okay, so that's it for today. Uh, oops, and I will, what did I do now? Okay, I'm back here. So I'm happy to ta take any more questions. So no new questions, but I do have an old question that, uh... mm -hmm might be good to hear from your words as well. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, what do we mean by an adjoint formulation of the type system? Right, okay. So, I mean, there's adjoint logics and, and in category theory, there are adjunctions. So basically the terminology comes from that, from there. Um, so it's, it's really this idea to take a layered approach. And uh, that really mandates also the use of this uh, split context. So that goes very handy. Uh, so one thing I can also point out is that um, that basically when you have um, when you have bang in linear logic, so we could even what we could do what I haven't shown is and we haven't currently actually we're exploring it, uh, but we could take the system that I just presented where we have like this shared context gamma. And we could add also the, the ban uh, from linear logic, so persistent servers to it, and then we have an extra context. But anyway, what I, if we had this, then we could also represent the ban basically with the shifts. Uh, so we have like a third layer, which would be like an unrestricted layer uh, with a copying semantics. And then we could have a ban would translate basically in an, into a downshift upshift. Uh, yeah, but really the adjoint formulation comes from adjoint logic and cat ad ad adjunctions category theory, but uh, I'm not the expert I, uh, there either. Okay, any, any more questions? There's a new one in chat. Okay. Uh, do, do you want to read it or? Uh, question, equivalent to the constraints that we have to finish with the same type QA is a new thing. Seems very essential. If yes, we lose some expressiveness. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, so it is, it's really fundamental uh, to, to ensure preservation, right? Because it makes sense. Uh, and I think it's, it's basically, as soon as you have effects, you somehow in, in a certain sense, it makes sure that whatever I want to, when I, whenever I re-encounter something, someone else kind of fiddled with it in the meantime, that it's in a, in a good state. And when you have like program verification where you have invariants or so, it's kind of the same idea. The invariant describes something that, uh, that always, um, you know, are maintained. Um, the question, however, so the, the, the Pavel who asked the question is right in that it's also a restriction. So it's a constraint, which might sometimes be not allow you to the programs in the way that you want them to write. And actually I want to point out, so Chuta uh, has been working with me and also Frank on a system where we relax that constraint. So we use subtyping so that we actually can permit um, more, more uh, programs to be expressed in the way that we naturally want them to, to, to express. Yeah, but, um, and I think there are other ideas to explore, but it is a constraint and it's important for preservation. 
Then I saw there's another uh, question by Prasant. And Prasant was also the person who asked his question on Slack about the, the trees and cuts. So I really appreciated that. OK, so Prasant asked, what are, do I mean by effects within the context of session type programs? OK, so I've, I've been, OK, so here's something I would like to share with you. Um, when we just have an into linear, linearly session type system, you can almost get away with viewing it as a functional, a pure, pure system. Because linearity, like the channels that you have at runtime almost behave like variables. So, uh, but, but they're not. Because the reason that it's effectful is because we have processes, we have runtime structures that get allocated, that get created at runtime. So what I mean with effects is, in a message passing setting, it means that if I exchange, interact with one process that I share, let's say, with Shuta, Shuta will be affected by whatever I do with this process. So by restricting it to equi-recursive, we kind of make sure that at least Shuta encounter, encounters the process in, in the expected state. So that it's willing, let's say again, if it's a Q to um, accept an acquire uh, an NQ or a DQ request, right? However, let's say it's a Q. I'm sharing that Q with Chuta. If I NQ an element, and Chuta goes ahead and DQ and DQs until the Q is empty, Chuta will get the element that I NQ. That's what I mean with effects. So it's it's there are it's it's there are side effects. And in this sense, really, a process language is an effectful thing. Like, like, uh, really think of the process tree that we get or the, the graph that we get at runtime. Think of it as a heap. 